you have to maintain control of your own, your own art, your own creativity. You don't give it away. Uh, Bandcamp tends to treat the artist better, but there's lots of things to understand and know about um, to use the internet so that it doesn't just use you. Um, then we had three talks on um, on free jazz accessibility and diversity. And the first was um, on education, because education is where we begin. Education is our entry in. And the, pro the, the big issue that was referred to was, um, you know, money. That how, the, if you could pay for your education, you can pay your, uh, for, to study with famous people. And then that becomes, and that is, it's no longer as accessible to, in the communities where it originally arose. It's no longer accessible there. And yet there are things that people are doing to address that. And there are many people who are now are with a growing concern on that. And uh, there, then we had a talk, we had two funders, one from New York State and uh, Chamber Music America. And Chamber Music America is national. And they basically just said what they can do. Uh, but there will be follow-up, and it, it was maybe the most important thing in having them there was that they were there for all, for all the other conversations <coughs> because they need, to, they need to understand how we think as artists and audience, as the people really are concerned. So they were there. And then the third panel was on performance opportunities, and everything ran so late that that got a little abbreviated. Um, and today is related to that, the first, especially this first one. Um, uh, Brandon Lopez is running late, but here he is right on time. Oh my God. Sorry about that. I was just introducing this panel. So this is on DIY, um, doing it yourself and how, that, how that's functioning in our community. Right now in the present day, I'm Andrew Drury, I wish he could have come back. He was supposed to be here yesterday, but it ran so late he couldn't talk yesterday and then he couldn't make it again today, so. Uh, but he has, there are many small um, DIY attempts. And in fact, Arts for Art was that. But I'm gonna hand the phone, who, who would like to begin? Sam Hilmer from a number of spaces he's developed. He's a musician in his own right, but he's developed various spaces in New York. Brandon Lopez plays everywhere. So I thought he doesn't do his own, but I thought it was really important to have That's the. Not true. You do? You do? I, yeah, I developed a See, lot. See, what do I know? A lot of you show know? series of good different groups and things like See, that. See, that's why he's here, to explain what he does. <laughs> I don't know everything, and that's what we're all here for, is to learn a little more. Uh, so which of you would like to begin? You can flip for it. Um, I'll say something, I suppose. <clears throat> well, you, you know, you're uh, Sam Helmer. Yes. Um, Hello. How's everybody doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Amazing. Um, it's... Uh, Great to be here participating in Vision Fest, a uh, legendary institution uh, in the community. It's all good. It's a party already. Um, lots of spilled drinks at DIY spaces, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so I mean, I guess I'll just you know, get something rolling about myself and what I do and provide some sort of you know, context and then just pass it down the line. Um, so, as uh, Patricia said, I'm a musician, I play in the band Z's, I play solo as Diamond Terrifier, and um, setting up and organizing events has been part of my practice for over 25 years now. I grew up in D.C. where there was a really vibrant punk scene and where the nomenclature DIY, kind of one of the places that it really began to take hold as like a uh, concept. Um, I think uh, one of the things that might be interesting to talk about today 
is the extent to which the idea of DIY or that construction has sort of lost focus in terms of how it's used. You know, like my daughter watches these videos on YouTube called DIYs about like kind of sprucing up your tote bag or like making a pencil holder or something like this. And the word is sort of bandied about in the context of like internet platforms where people can sell stuff that they make or like whatever, you know. Um, so it kind of went from in my lifetime and in my experience, which is limited, but um, it went from referring almost only to circumstances where um, communities with a sense of mission and intention um, would um, engage in self-elected collaboration to propagate some type of uh, performance or series or a record label or what have you, and, uh, and, and specifically to do so outside of the context of the uh, structures and systems and edifices that would normally be available to somebody to do something like that, right? So if you're a musician trying to um, make, a, make an album or set up a performance, wherein normally you might pursue management and representation and sign to a label and then have your booking agent reach out to a larger club, uh, the DIY sensibility would be to do those same things, make music and uh, put out records and stuff, but all outside of the context of the institutions that are kind of in place to do that. You know, just you and your friends, you get together and you make it happen somehow, even if it's not getting the acknowledgement of the powers that be, so to speak. So this is kind of when I first encountered that phrase, it, it kind of meant that and only that. And if you weren't part of an effort like that, you probably wouldn't even know what somebody was talking about if you were to say DIY. And now it's become this thing where it's like, it's DIY, it's locally sourced produce, it's tote bags, it's sunglasses, it's, you know what I mean? It's just like, it just gets kind of slapped onto anything where like maybe the demographic that that issue is a kind of crunchy sort of left-leaning group of people and if they put this sticker on it, then maybe they'd be more likely That's to come. The yeah. empire commodifies everything. Yeah, for sure. at the end. So it's kind of especially really, something like especially DIY. Yeah, yeah, at the end, yeah. yeah. It's already after the end of the world, right? Oh. <laughs> Fami yeah. Familiar trope, familiar trope. Um, um, so, um, so I, I mean, I think that's something that's interesting is the manner in which the, I think, I think that the spirit and the intention of DIY lives very, like, strongly. It's like very, very present and it's, and it's also been present in um, American uh, culture of all stripes, but specifically American culture, um, musical culture, from the time of shape note singing and field hollers to techno and the advent of the turntable as an instrument and, and beyond, you know? But the, the nomenclature has sort of lost its grip on that experience, and maybe that's something that we could address today. Um, so yeah, so I run the space Hollow, and I opened the space Transpico, so I started the music program at Knockdown Center, and I've done a lot of um, programming in the context of the uh, fine arts world, and I'm really interested in uh, what's happening with the idea of DIY, and I'm also really curious to hear more about how that has found expression in the context of free jazz and its evolution, you know, from its inception to the present. So I'll pass the mic. Oh, I don't have to pass the mic. I mean, look at this. There's so many resources here at Roulette. It's just like unreal, man. There's two, two mics. Uh, my name is Brandon Lopez. Uh, I've been. Well, when I first moved to New York, kind of out of necessity, I needed to start putting on my own shows. I found a space and weekly put on a, a three-band bill. It was on Sullivan Street in uh, the West Village. And um, subsequently moved to Bushwick, and from there I was running, I was throwing a bunch of shows in, in lofts, and um, eventually was uh, partnered with a friend, Max Almario, at Manhattan Inn. So for about three or four years, we were there programming the music, uh, programming the music every week. So I was there maybe twice a week doing that. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a, it's a, the DIY is a huge part of my practice. I mean, uh, the way that I tour um, is, is the way that I, like I don't have an agent. I don't have anyone who's actually helping me um, uh, deal with like um, promotion of gigs or um, or organization, you know, of my own life or um, yeah, or even how uh, you know 
Yeah, I mean, every, everything that I do is essentially DIY. Um, um, whether that's, you know, yeah, funding shows, gigs. Um, I just want to ask you a question sure. that, that may yeah. be. What is the, well, what is the financial repercussions of these different kinds of DIY experiences? What, yeah. I mean, for, for years, it's paying people out of my own pocket. He's talking to Mike. Because oh. we, we're recording this, okay. and this is I mostly going to live For years, I was, uh, I was working, like, shitty jobs and paying people out of pocket for, for whatever I could. I mean, I would sometimes have to source a drum kit. I would have to borrow a car, like pay for the gas, like move everybody, you know, into a certain space. I mean, at Manhattan Inn, Max was doing a weekly drum series. That was that's kind of what started that space. Max, uh, who? Oh, Mario. Uh, he's a drummer, um, really great drummer, but mostly does indie rock stuff now. But, um, and I mean, we, you know, had to, we had to fund that ourselves, you know. I mean, he was he was paying he was giving people like a hundred dollar guarantees, which is a lot of money for for someone with no no money. You know? um, right, right. So I mean, the financial repercussions are that that I don't I feel like I've spent um, most of I don't think I've ever made money in my life. How about that? Like all of it is is uh, put back into music. Uh, so is, is that a financial repercussion? <laughs> Yeah, I I'm mean, the, well, the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's a relatively, well, I'm not going to, I think it's not uncommon, but, um, and not that that's right, but it's not uncommon. I mean, I, I, I just, I've never really given a shit about money, about having capital, so, but that's, that's just how I am personally. I don't mind, uh, I don't mind losing it. Yeah, yeah William Parker. I was going to well, keep him for later, but I think you need to be part of this well, conversation, not separate. Like even a place like this, R Roulette, I'm, I'm on the board of Roulette. And um, if the place is packed and you have grant money to pay musicians, you still end up out on the, in the red. So it's, it's very difficult to, as we, as we talked about it many times, uh, if every seat is taken and uh, you pay the musicians, you pay the staff, you don't make any money. So you, 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 it's constantly subsidized through, through grants and, and aid from, from fundraising. So independently, uh, the, 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 the idea of an independent gig is to do the gig. It's not, it's not to make money, it's to um, come out and play and try to uh, cultivate an audience. I mean, I don't think anybody that's ever, well, let me say, anybody, I don't think a lot of people, when they set up a gig, they're not thinking about making money. Although it is possible um, if, you, if you don't have any overhead. You know, I mean, like the stone, we make money you know, in a, without putting out money. But then the Stone is kind of an, an exclusive club in a way that not everybody gets invited to play. Uh, <clears throat> but there should be more places like the Stone. And the young people should be thinking creatively how to alter the concept of doing it yourself and how to make it better, and how to cultivate, uh, uh, build up the audience, because your, your saving grace is the audience. You know, I was playing with you know, Don Cherry. Don Cherry could plop anywhere, do, put up, I'm playing tonight, and you know, three, 400 people would show up. Of course, he's Don Cherry, he has a history, but how do you get a history? How do you get known, how do you raise your profile. All of these things have to be done and hopefully reach more people, raise your profile, and uh, develop your music and present your music. So it's, it's quite a um, 
a challenge, but it, it, I still, it can be done. You know, you <clears throat> I just want to get back to the, the stay on the subject. So basically, the idea of DIY and the broader cultural con the conversation is really, that's all like how do you survive, how do you succeed, how do you make the art available? So there's two ways. You either, there's, a lot, there's someone giving you money to do it or you do it anyway. And um, <clears throat> I, so there are pros and cons to both of these things, by the way. Um, and I was going to do this all as separate things, but I'm going to make this all one long panel. <laughs> and it's, so the, the, I want to look at the pros and cons of doing it yourself. And like just, just as clearly as possible, what are the pros of doing it yourself? The pros of doing it yourself. Okay, I'm going to try to make the answer to this question relatable to what William and Brandon were just talking about. Because I think that um, the matter of making money and developing a fan base and um, being able to make money on hard ticket sales, um, I, I agree with William, is, is possible. And um, I've seen a lot of communities of social and aesthetic practice succeed at doing that, even people who are doing things you know, rather difficult to uh, digest. Um, and um, I, I also think it's really important that musicians and artists continue to hold that out as a goal. I think that um, I'm going to bring this all back around to DIY. You have to have faith. It's, it's, it's we're going to get. It's going to be very elliptical and sort of. But it, we're going to arrive. Um, I think it's. Um, I think it's important for um, musicians and artists to develop a fan base, to make that a goal, to try to reach people. You know, and I mean, when I came in, um, William and this gentleman who I gather lives in Minnesota, we're talking about you know touring, like doing hard touring in a in a station wagon and going from place to place and um, you know just being on the road and uh, when when you do things like that you develop you build up fan bases one person at a time you know what I mean and I think kind of like the the logic of the internet makes that seem almost completely impossible you know it's like wait one person at a time like I can put this thing on here and get 500 clicks in an afternoon like what how am I going to drive to Pittsburgh to meet one person like what do you say? you know what I mean it just seems like completely crazy but in reality, that is how people get fans. That is how people develop fan bases over lifetimes of practice. And um, uh, a lot of the, I, I think there's been a, 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 a kind of veering away from DIY practice, even though I think the, the sort of uh, loosening up of the kind of what that can mean um, has facilitated a kind of straying from what it means, wherein communities of artists, I think, are, are um, increasingly See, seeking to be more dependent upon institutions, corporations, and people with deep pockets because that seems like the most expedient way towards having a career and making money. And in the doing, they, they kind of let go of that um, attitude of like, we'll drive from place to place. And hey, if we're, if we're playing Ypsilanti, Michigan on a Tuesday and there's two or three people in the audience, you know what, guess what, I'm about to change these two or three people's lives, they're gonna remember this forever, you know what I mean? I mean, those are really the people who buy your vinyl records on the internet maybe, or in person for the rest of their lives because they never forget that Tuesday in Ypsilanti, Michigan, right? But, but this kind of veering away from that mentality, be like, well, why would I drive all the way across the country and play like 16 cities to get to LA when I could just fly to L LA on Red Bull's dollar and play for 500 people? Right, this kind of mentality, I think, has um, taken people out of the sort of trenches of DIY and out of the attitude of like hardcore grassroots fan-based development. So that brings us to the pros. I think the pro of D the pros of DIY um, is that um, is that it's real. It feels real. And I think that we exist in a moment where even if this is hard for people to articulate and it's maybe not like on the front page, people are really hungry for a sense of authenticity um, and a sense that they belong to something. And that they're part of something important, you know? That um, a group of people could um, choose to engage a certain mission. I mean, Arts for Art and Vision Fest is a great example of this. 
or um, AACM, also a great example that's kind of within the wheelhouse of this organization, but there's lots of great examples like the uh, label Discord from DC, that a group of people could um, engage a mission and engage in self-elected um, collaboration and create something that could be joined, that exists outside of the um, structures that maybe otherwise are in place to support things like that, but that maybe these people feel excluded from, right? Um, and that when they do that, they, part they, they shape the direction of the cultural conversation of their community and maybe of their city and ultimately writ large of, of, this, of the, the country they live in and, they, and it can have an impact on the global conversation. And when local groups of people feel like they can do that, that becomes something that has extreme magnetism, you know, because people want to belong. They want to contribute something that matters and they want to feel like what they're doing is important. Th this is really where large audiences come from, I think, you know, um, a sense of that it's not like I, it's not like when you're, when you're at home, I mean, the, the internet is an incredibly alienating thing. It's like, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a tool of alienation and surveillance. And you're at home and you, you hear something on a Spotify playlist or something. And then you're like, I really like this. I'm going to go to this concert, right? Like that experience. Like I like this thing and I want to see it in person. So I'm going to the concert so I can have this experience. It's not really a very engaging process. You know what I mean? Versus I belong to this community. I know the people who are playing. It's important that I show up because the thing that they're doing matters writ large in the cultural conversation. And, um, and, and it's important to my identity that I do that, right? That's engaging, you know? That's, that's the big win, that's the long-term hustle, you know what I mean? Like, when you, can, uh, when you can galvanize a group of people behind a, a sense of mission like that. And I think that doing things DIY specifically enables that, but it also demands that. If you don't have that kind of um, commitment and dedication from a community at your back when you go into something DIY, you're gonna be just washed away because the, the powers that be have every other kind of resource at their back, whereas all you really have is like a vibe and charisma and like your friends, right? But that's a lot. So I, I think, I think the, the, the main pro of DIY is that it, it demands of the um, practitioner that they get out there and beat the pavement and develop a community and like have values and make it about something and like get to a vibe the group of people, which I think is like the, the, the big win of any musical community. Sorry, that was so long. I apologize. I won't talk for the next 15 minutes. Fine, man. That's <laughs> out. I'm tapping out. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's a big difference between a slave revolt and, uh, and then trying to seek freedom and, uh, and get some land than, you know, taking a bank loan and going to buy land. And you have about, let's just take it from 1960 till now, you have 59 years of the, the slow dumbing down uh, of America. I mean, uh, the, where everything is, what they use this word pushback, well, uh, one sense you are playing catch up by trying to equalize things, or like 1965, you have the right to vote, and um, you're dealing with post-traumatic slave syndrome. If you if you're black, if you're playing creative music or trying to write poetry, you 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 have everything is against you, and it's slowly pushing you back to what you have now. You know, with arts. Uh, funding is is cut, and in in the '60s, so it was called self the, the '60s, '70s, and '80s. It sort of ended when Jimmy Carter left office. That was the 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 marking point. Death of the left. Hmm? The death of the left. Well, I don't know. It's just that it was. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Ronald Reagan, who was like the uh, for us was the worst president, was the beginning of the. I mean, outside of George Washington and them, when we weren't, I wasn't around, so I don't know how bad he was. But uh, since 1777, you know, we've always had bad presidents. 
uh, the fact that it's 1777 and then you don't get a civil rights bill to 1965, that's a long time of looking the other way. But anyway, um, things began to really change. And so in the 60s and 70s, you had self-determination, which basically was that the mainstream musicians, post-bebop musicians, were taken care of by George Ween. And George Ween was the, the, like the, the godfather of, uh, of promoters and what you call the, um, the head of the, of the jazz plantation system, okay? And he took care of all the musicians from Miles Davis to Wayne Shorter to you name it, you know, he, he took care of me, ran all the major festivals around Europe. So if you got on the good side of George Ween, you could work forever. Now, if you were on the bad side of George Ween, uh, although, although, you know, Miles Davis hated George Ween and George Ween hated Miles Davis. I mean, no one liked him, but at the same time, he was providing employment. So what did you do? Uh, you, you, you did self-determination. You said, okay, well, we're not being hired by the mainstream jazz institution, so we want to, and also we feel bad is that we're not making any money that we like. You know, you say, well, isn't that like the third house George Wayne bought? Doesn't he have like, you know, X number of cars? Doesn't the guy, you know, I mean, these guys are building money. And, uh, and the, the musicians want it, they still have this thing, you know, they want to be stars. You know, it was a star system. They want to make money like, uh, you know, like Elvis Presley, or whoever was making money at the time. And uh, because that was, that was grill into your head. You know, this is America. You can make money. You know, um, that's why Ornette Coleman uh, began to ask for large sums of money. Because he was looking, you know, he was playing and he was packing the place. And then another musician, I won't name names, uh, was making three, four times the money he was making. So he raised his price to like asking up to $60,000 for a gig, $40,000 for one gig, because he thought that's what he was worth. Um, so things like that were happening. And then Ornette Coleman, Rashid Ali, uh, participated in the self-determination movement. In 1973, uh, Rashid Ali opened Ali's Alley, December 31st, 1973. And um, he opened up a club where you could play seven nights a week. And, um, and he paid a lot for it. You know, I mean, uh, he was renting then $400 a month, Rashi was paying. And um, he, 77 yeah, 77 Green Street. Um, and uh, he paid, and what I mean by pay, well, like people do DY, What's it called? DIY, DIY now. But Rashid got attacked and assaulted by the mafia two times. <laughs> First time, he, they, this, they broke his jaw, you know. And, and like, so at least now when you do it, you, has anybody got their bro jaw broken because of the deal? <laughs> you did? Yeah. OK, well, was it the mafia? No. No, it was not the mafia. OK. <laughs> well. <laughs> Well, in those days, if you owned a club, you know, they wanted a cigarette machine. They wanted certain things. So, they changed their strategy. They're still <laughs> yes. around, but yeah, they're like, you know, just, you know, and then Ornette Coleman and a lot of other musicians, and, and what they did was they got their own spaces because the rent was cheap, and they presented their own concerts. But at the end, Rashi closed Alley's Alley because, one, it was a lot of work, and two, he was not making any money. See, because musicians, when they say, well, I, I'll, I'll play at your club, but I need, you know, $2,000. Now, they don't, or $3,000, or th whatever they want. Now, it's not up to them to say, well, um, whatever, if you say, okay, I want you to play, I'll give you the money. It's not up to the musician to say, well, um, where'd you get the money? Did you break even? No, they get their money, they did their job, the same as the electrician. The electrician doesn't say, well, are you making any money? 
Did you make any money tonight? No, he does his job, the plumber does his job, et cetera, et cetera. So Rashid closed because he just wasn't making any money and it was a lot of work. And then by the 80s, all the, the real estate began to go up, so all the loft scene began to close. But then you say, okay, now, in 1970, you're 20 years old. 1980, you're 30 years old. Okay, now, you put out a certain number of records, and then 19, what comes after 19? Uh, 90? 90, okay. <laughs> all right, well, there's, all right, 1990 comes next. Okay, anyway, you're getting older, and if, and if 1970, you were already 40, all right, you, you, you're 60 years old. Are you established at 60 years old? No. Okay, Charles Gale comes up, he's, he's, in, he's, in, his, he's in his late 50s when he comes up, and he does, goes to Europe, but is he, is he established? Is he set for life? No. So a musician has to constantly, as we used to say, nobody promised you a rose garden. So it's a constant struggle to make money, to present your music, and that's why everybody says, oh, would you like to come over to Paris and play? Would you like to come over to Germany and play? Would you like to come over to France and play? And everyone goes to Europe. Because when you get there, you get off the plane and the photographers are there. They, 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 they treat you like a king over there compared to over here. So it's a dilemma. And we always said, if you don't develop America and you keep going to Europe, what's going to happen is, well, Europe, is, one of these days, is going to dry up. And it's beginning to dry up. The last 15 years, it's, 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 Europe is slowly drying up. It's, it's, it's presenting the raisin effect, the prune effect in Europe. You know, I mean, they still have money, and you can still go over there, but it's slowly beginning to, to, to close up. So now what are we going to do? And... We, we, we're getting, but now you, you say, I'm, I'm almost 70 years old. How am I, why, how come I can't, why do I have to present myself at 70 years old? Because it didn't go anywhere. You know, I mean, someone left the jazz scene and came back after 40 years. He said, well, what did I miss? What did I miss? Oh, it's about the same. The business is the same when you left 20 years ago. I said, that's pitiful. But that's how it is. I mean, it, it doesn't move. You know, it doesn't move, and it's a constant, constant struggle. So the, 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 the pros are, for doing it yourself, is that you've done something. You know, you stopped, you, you, you got out of the give me the gig, we, we used to call it the give me, the give me a gig mentality. Give me a gig, give me a gig, give me a gig. Can I have a gig? Can I have a gig? And so you gave yourself a gig. And that's, that's very positive. You began to empower yourself. And, um, and, and that's a positive thing. Let's talk about the cons for a minute. Just for a minute, I don't think, I don't wanna get too deep into it, but what, what are the, just being clear, and, and I'm saying this so that people who are listening either now or on the internet later, they we're clear about it. And, 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 and trying to be as objective as completely unobjective people can be, because no one's objective. This is our lives. This is what we all, you know, this is what we live and live for. So we're not really objective, but trying to sound it. <laughs> so what are the cons of, de of doing it yourself? The cons, you spend a lot of money doing it. Um, I've had to work a day job for the last... I've never had to not work a day job. Um, uh, sometimes you show up to uh, a DIY show and it's run like complete... It's run really bad. Really, really poorly. It's run like shit. So then you have to deal with that. You know, you show up to a space and they're not there or... Uh, <laughs> I had one, one, one instance where we we packed the place. This is in New York. We packed the place. Oh, I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. We packed the place, and uh, the promoter came up to me afterwards, and she, she, she was like, uh, "We made six hundred dollars at the door. Um, I'm thinking about giving you like, you know, like." Would you guys be good with like a hundred dollars? You know, 
And it was packed because of the, the group that I was with. Because this person wanted to pay some other people more money because they were, you know, it was more advantageous for it. So there's a lot of uh, fucked up, uh, there are, yeah, it can get a little, it can get a little hyphy. But, and I mean, you get tired of lugging your gear around too, I mean, dragging a bass around everywhere and a, ba and a bass amp and a drum kit. I don't know. I don't know what else yeah, am I going to say. Yeah, those are all sucks. cons. Are, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you get completely screwed. Sometimes, like, you know, like, uh, sometimes it's great. It can be, it could be either end of the spectrum. It's either the best, like, I've, I've had the best gigs of my life, like, in DIY venues and r running my own shows, and I had the absolute, like, worst, like, um, you know, you're in a squat in uh, Lausanne or something like that, and there's, like, uh, there's no light, and you're sleeping next to some, you know, some, like, wasted like punk kid who's got scabies and he's snoring really loud and you're like what the f like why the hell am i doing this so like those moments where i'm like i need to go to law school and take care of myself but it never happened so far so i guess it's not that bad <clears throat> cons um i mean i think that like i mean in general, I would say this about just being an artist or a musician. Um, like, I, I have a daughter, she's 11, you know, and she's, like, my wife's an artist. And, I mean, she's, lo it looks like that's, she's going down that road. But I never really suggested it, per se. I mean, it's, it's what she knows, you know, so. Um, but I, I, some of the best advice that was ever given to me as a young musician was, if you don't have to do this, don't do it. Like, if you could be a dentist or an accountant or somebody's secretary or personal assistant or personal trainer, just any, if there's really any other option, if like part of you is like, you know, maybe I'll just do this, you know, like real estate thing or like what, do that. Do you know what I mean? Just like, just do that, you know? And I think that like, that's really where you check that bag at the door. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, like, come on, you know what I'm saying? Like, if anybody's surprised by the conditions of doing art and music in America, like, I mean, they, they haven't been paying attention. I mean, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a war, you know, it's not, it's like, if you can't, it, it's, it, if you're a, if you're like a doctor and you signed up to do like triage and get helicoptered into some spot and, you know, like do surgery under a hail of gunfire, like in the mud and the trench, I mean, you can't, if that's what you signed up for, then, I mean, what's the point of talking about the drawbacks? I mean, you know what I mean? It's like you went there because it was that way. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, that's what you chose. If you were expecting a family practice with a little sign on the door in like the English basement apartment of some building and kids are gonna come and stick out their tongues, right, then you wouldn't have chosen to do that. Do you know what I mean? Like, but if that's your, like uh, a guy, I used to run um, arts-based community after school programs and stuff and a, a manager that was really close to me once when we were talking about just managing the situations, we were in like Bushwick, bed Brownsville, you know, we were like managing the situations that would come in and working with some of the younger staff that didn't really know what to expect, what they were really signing up for. And, and he used to say, if you're a fireman, smoke and fire has to be your shit. You know what I mean? Because that's what you're gonna get if you're a fireman, you know what I mean? And that's really how I, I feel about it. I don't really, I mean, look, I get, I get, I get into like abysmally dark moods and you know, I have a, a relatively um, hectic emotional landscape, you know, but if given the opportunity to, you know, um, actually say what I think in a moment of repose, I, I really don't allow myself to wander down this like drawback lane. You know what I mean? Like it's um, the, the, the story, the story of American culture has always been this dialectic between like extreme harrowing vacuity and like sociopathic people trying to take your money with whatever garbage they could put in front of you and deeply inspired thinly capitalized but like like almost preternaturally charismatic people that like take any hit for the cause I mean that's it you look at hip-hop techno punk I mean, I'm not going to speak for jazz because I'm not a practitioner and there are people here who would be more 
wise in the ways of speaking about that. But like in my experience about what I do know about, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the uh, choice I see. You know what I mean? So if you signed up, if you enlisted, then you know you got to have a positive solutions-based attitude and get in the trenches and get it done. And uh, you know, success is doing the next one. You know what I'm saying? Thick skin too. That's how I feel about it. Well, it, it's basically, um, you know, being a musician is a calling. And if you, uh, though, though nowadays a lot of people are musicians because they uh, think it's a profession, but it's like doctors, it's like anything. You have a lot of doctors and they're not healers. They, they just went to medical school and they know how to be a doctor. But they don't really um, have that magic thing around them. And it's the same with musicians and artists. A lot of people come out, they're musicians, and um, they don't have that magic thing, that, 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 that transformative thing. And uh, but on the other hand, it's a musician's job to play music, OK? Uh, and you, can, you have to make a choice. You say, well, I only want to play music. I mean, there was a group called the Revolutionary Ensemble in, in the 70s. Uh, Leroy Jenkins and Sarone and Jerome Cooper. And, you know, so we hanging out. And then at a certain point, they said, well, we're not going to leave our house for less than $500 a gig. And they stayed in that house for a long time. <laughs> but they were tough customers. They did not budge. Okay, by hook or crook, they found a way to survive. And when it came to their music, they kept that sucker pure. I mean, I'm not, if, if it doesn't pay what I want, I'm not going to do it. And so there's those type of musicians who, who dig into the trench and say, if I don't get the money I need, because eventually what the theory is that the money, uh, you'll get the money you want. And, and they won't budge from it. And there are lot, musicians like that today who they want a certain amount, and they don't get it, they don't play, they, they stay home. And you say, well, now I wouldn't tell anybody to do that because, okay, you have, it's a, it's a matter of faith. You have bills to pay, you've got um, people to take care of, and you hope that that will happen. And if you gotta get a day job, you have to, because some people get day jobs, some people get teaching jobs, you end up having to do it, but, your, your job is to be a musician. And, um, and then you have other people who, are, who sacrifice. You mentioned the word sacrifice, I think, who set up festivals, who, make, who work for the artists, work for the ungrateful artists, by the way. They're ungrateful. They don't care. All they want is give me a gig and ba ba da bop and boop de boop. They don't care that, that you actually could be doing something else. And if you stop doing it, sh there'd be a big drop in the scene. And you see this all over the country. Anderson, Indiana. I was in Anderson, and who here has been to Anderson, Indiana? <laughs> okay, there was a guy in Anderson, to Indi Indi Indiana, who was bringing musicians in, you know. And we went to Anderson, Indiana. And the time we were there, there was a clairvoyant convention. And he put us in the motel with, at the clairvoyant convention. And you'd go there and you'd sit down and somebody said, oh, don't sit there, my uncle's sitting there. And you get up and you say, oh, okay, okay. So, so we were dealing with that kind of stuff, but, <laughs> but people were coming. And, 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 and we were introduced, and then we, we did country and western clubs, and he would introduce us. He says, now you're going to see a guy going crazy on the bass and banging on the piano. He, I mean, piano, not piano, piano. And we played for those country and western people and those got truck drivers, and they loved it. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's all kinds of things to do. And, you know, I mean, you, you could tell stories for days about the gigs you do. But it's a chance. It's, it's a matter of faith that you decided to do this, so you do it. And if you've got a family, you, you, you do whatever you have to do to survive, to take care of your kids and your family. And it's not 
uh, sacrifice. You know, any less you say, well, I have a day job because I don't want to have the sacrifice, the music I love. So I'll, I do my day job and then I play my music. In New Orleans, all the musicians had day jobs. You know, and, and the old, you know, they were barbers, they were tailors, they were carpenters, and at the end of the night, they played in the speakeasies. So having a day job is not like a, a lower form of, of, of musician. You know, it's, it's, it's a form of survival, which poor people know about, and they have to do what they have to do. So, so I don't think there's any drawbacks to producing y yourself. You know, it's work, but then you don't have to do it. You can, you, you can, you can trench down like the Revolutionary Ensemble and never leave, <laughs> never leave your house for 10 years. But they weren't, they weren't unhappy. You know, they, 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 they practice every single day, the same as Ornette Coleman, just practicing. They said, where's the gig, Ornette? I'm no, no gig. There's no gig. So why are you practicing all day long, one, practicing one tune for six hours? Oh, well, there's no gig, but that's dedication. But then you say, well, Ornette, um, who's paying your rent? Um, you hear the mumble. You know, he had his way. He, he had a, oh, so you have a guardian angel. So you can also have that. You can have a guardian angel. You can have someone who subsidizes you. You know, all of these things are possible. And, um, and then you can be a guy that says, you know, if I don't have any good luck. I don't get any gigs, and uh, we know who this person is. You, you, play, you played with him. You see, he's laughing. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we could be like that, but even he. We, we, we rehearsed every week whether we had a gig or not. There you and go. The rehearsals were from 4 to, to 10, sometimes 11. Francois would cook us food. There you go. And and it was you were in your community, you were going inside, and that was cool. And, and, and somehow you found a way to get over, you know. I was the best time in my life. Every week, one day. That's great. We didn't work that much, although kind of we did work with some day. The best things I've ever played. Yeah. I just wanted to... Um, jump in kind of in response to some of the things that William said. And I, I think that it's, um, we're, we're talking about DIY, right? And, 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 and we're kind of burrowing into that subject. But I think it's also kind of important to put it in context. And that like, I mean, to me, if I'm, if I'm in a setting that is clearly DIY, I'm working with musicians, the people running the space are also artists. It's, it's something that exists by its own volition, its own, it's just like willpower and charisma that's like propping it up, right? Then there's like there's one set of expectations and there's a way of doing business and like there's a whole kind of code about how you comport yourself in that setting, in my opinion. Um, at the same time, as musicians, I mean all of us up here, like there's moments in in your career and there's moments in your year where the people that you're working with aren't part of that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they're not in a community that you belong to, right? And I mean, this would describe, to me, this is like museums, galleries, corporate sponsored things, um, the deeper institutions, you know, like, I mean, I might be like inclined to, you know, do something at roulette for not a lot of money just because it's a cool thing, but you know, I, I've, been, I've been playing at roulette since it was on green, right, green? Um, and you know, I know Jim Staley, and it, you know, it's a thing. I appreciate that it exists. I don't want to try to like bleed this cat dry. Do you know what I mean? It's like if he says he has a hundred dollars, I believe him. I'll take the hundred dollars. It come out. I live a half an hour away. I don't care, right? But if it's Columbia University, it's like take the money. Talk to my agent, bro. It's like yeah. a completely different story. And and I don't think that snipping out what's what, like what is an actual grassroots community propagated by artists that's for us by us, and then pulling out that toolkit to negotiate that. And then figuring out, okay, wait a minute, like, who who's funding this? Like, where is this? So, who who wrote the check though? Do you know what I mean? Like, actually getting that information and finding out what is at issue in the way of resources in a given festival or university environment, or turns out something is like, you know, oh, it's night 
night whatever, you know? And you're like, well, what's night whatever? It's like, oh, it's the presenting arm of Pap's Blue Ribbon. It's like, oh, okay, all right. You know what I mean? And then you get the information and then you get out that toolkit. It's like, if there's, look, if there's money, get the money. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm not on some like martyr vibe up here. That's not what I'm saying. You know what I mean at all? But like, when, when, it, comes to, when it comes to DIY, when, to me, that specifically refers to communities of artists making things happen on their own, then, then you, 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 you know, th that, that's what kind of like engages a lot of what like Brandon was talking about and what I was kind of talking about in the sort of like, if you're a fireman, smoke and fire's got to be your shit. It's like, I'm willing to take a hit, take an L for a bunch of artists that are my peers. Do you know what I mean? But I also think it's really important for artists to have the um, kind of like financial and like professional li like literacy and fluency to know when that's not the case. Because there's a lot of folks out there now, especially from like corporate entities and stuff, trying to sort of like dress it up like it's a community thing. Like, well, hey, we're one of you, man, you know? And try to get artists to do something for like no money at all. Meanwhile, they're like really sitting on stacks. You know yeah. what I mean? They like so really so have so money so and it would be like no big deal for them to pay you 500 or or $1,000. When, when that's the case, like, put all that DIY shit aside and, and get that money because the corporate folks and the big deep pocket institution po folks should pay for this. I mean, Everyone should know. Without a doubt. I mean, I want to just be clear about that.